Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to talk about buffer capacity. Now, as a reminder from our previous video, the purpose of a buffer solution is to resist changes in pH that occur when small amounts of acid or base are added to it. There's going to be some pH change that occurs, but it's going to be very minimal in comparison to what could have taken place had that buffer system not been in place. Now, a buffer system works because there's an equilibrium that exists between the original weak substance and its conjugate partner, either a weak acid with its conjugate base or a weak base with its conjugate acid. And so when I add in that additional amount of acid or base, it'll cause a reaction that'll shift that equilibrium around, and that shifting equilibrium is what minimizes the change in pH that we end up seeing. So to talk about this a little bit more, let's talk about acetic acid. We see here an equilibrium system between acetic acid, which is a weak acid, water, then here's the back and forth equilibrium between hydronium ion and its conjugate base of acetate polyatomic ion. Now, ideally, you would want equal concentrations of that weak acid and the conjugate base. Why? Because that puts you in the middle of what is referred to as the buffer zone. Having equal concentrations of those two substances allows us to shift equilibrium either direction depending on if we're adding an acid or a base without worrying about the fact that at some point that pH will start to change dramatically. If we're kind of on the extreme ends of that buffer zone, then we start to run into the problem of, well, maybe if I add a little bit more acid or a little bit more base, that might push me outside of that buffer zone and I might start to get some significant change in pH. So I've got to be really careful when those concentrations are not equal to each other. You can still have a buffer system if those two are not equal, but the further apart they get, the less ideal of a buffer solution you have. So again, perfect buffer solution, the ideal buffer solution, would have equal concentrations of the weak acid along with its conjugate base. And as a reminder from when we calculated with the HH equation in our previous video, at that point the pH will equal the pKa of your acid. Now, and let's say I add in some acid. Let's say I add in some hydronium ion. I know that that acid would end up reacting with my conjugate base. And when it does so, it pushes the equilibrium back this other direction to where I end up producing a little bit extra of my weak acid. So now my weak acid is in a slightly higher concentration than at my conjugate basis. And so what happens is that the pH ends up slightly lower than that pKa was because now we're a little bit more acidic in nature. Now, we still have a buffer here as long as I don't add too much acid, but we have gotten off of being the ideal buffer at that point. On the flip side, let's say I react it with a base. A base with hydroxide would end up reacting with the acid to end up shifting equilibrium more towards the conjugate base side of things. And so that would cause the conjugate base to be in a slightly higher concentration than my weak acid. And so now the pH gets slightly higher than that pKa value would be. Now, to kind of think about this in terms of a titration curve. We see here the titration curve of acetic acid with some strong base, let's say maybe sodium hydroxide. Now, when the weak acid and the conjugate base are equal and that pH equals the pKa, as a reminder, that occurs at our half equivalence point. So that is the ideal point of our buffer solution. Now, for acetic acid, when I take the pKa, that equals a value of 4.74. So that is the pH of an ideal buffer solution for acetic acid. However, if I add, say, a little bit of acid to it, that's going to shift us back on this curve, whereas if I add a little bit of base to it, that's going to shift me forward on this curve. Now, you notice here, 
that this flat zone is where I have my buffer zone. So if I start to get a little too extreme on either end of things, that can really start to veer off from that ideal pH, especially when I'm adding base, because at some point I'm going to hit the equivalence point, and now my pH is going to skyrocket enormously. So I have to be really careful that I don't add too much acid or base. However, what we're going to talk about here in a moment is the fact that depending on what kind of concentrations I have to start off with, I might have a little more leeway in this buffer zone. So the buffer capacity refers to how much of that acid or base can I add before I get out of that buffer zone? What can I do to make that buffer more effective? What can I do to help it take in more acid or more base and still be within that buffer zone. Now, before we discuss that, I do want to talk about the whole idea of why we want the buffer in there. Okay, so it gives us here two beaker scenarios, one representing a buffer solution of acetic acid and our acetate ion, so the same buffer solution we saw up above, and the other representing a beaker of water. Now, right here, I have my acetate along with my acetic acid and you notice they're in equal molarities so here's that perfect buffer for acetic acid of a pH of 4.74 that is my pKa here uh, with no buffer I just have water and so that has a pH of 7. So then what we're going to do is we're going to add a small amount of sodium hydroxide which is a strong base to both of these beakers and we're going to see what happens to our pH level. And I notice here on the one that has a buffer solution that the pH only goes up to 4.80 when I add in that NaOH. Now I have to be careful if I added too much NaOH, obviously then that would push me out of the buffer zone, but we added just enough here that I'm still in the buffer zone. However, here I add in NaOH and look at the huge jump in pH that I get. Back over here, we only had 0 0.06 pH change. On this water, we had 5.30 pH change. So again, Having that buffer solution meant that we could take in a lot more of that base and see a minimal change in pH in comparison to a solution that didn't have a buffer solution in place. Now again, not all buffer solutions are equally effective in resisting pH. It depends on the characteristics of the buffer system. So the effectiveness of a substance to resist changes in pH is known as the buffer capacity. How much acid and base can I take in before we get to see those changes occur in pH? The more I can take in of an acid or base, then we would say that the greater the buffer capacity of that solution. So with that said, let's go ahead and flip the page. All right, it says here that buffer capacity represents the amount of hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions the buffer can neutralize before the pH of the buffer begins to change a significant amount. Again, this is referring to that buffer zone. How much acid or how much base can I take in before I get out of being in that buffer zone? The more I can take in before I get out of the buffer zone, then that means I have a greater buffer capacity. Now it says also here that buffers most effectively resist a change in pH in either direction when the concentrations of the weak acid at base and its conjugate partner are equal in concentration. Again, this is referring to that ideal point, that middle point within the buffer zone where I can both absorb an acid and decrease my pH or absorb in base and increase my pH, but those increases still leave me within the buffer zone itself, okay? That gives us that capability of shifting either direction and still being in that buffer zone. Now that buffer zone is considered a usable pH range. What range of pH would I see for that buffer zone? And usually the usable pH range is whatever the pKa value is, plus or minus one. So for example, for the acetic acid that we saw on the previous page, it had a pKa of 4.74. What that means is anywhere from 
3.74 up to 5.74 would be considered the buffer zone. But here's the deal. Just because that pH is the buffer zone doesn't mean I can't change some molarities, some concentrations around in order to get us to absorb in more H or more OH and still stay within that range. So here's the deal. Molarity can also affect the buffer's ability to resist pH changes. So let's talk about that. Um, we've got down here two buffer solutions shown. Uh, both of these buffer solutions have hydrofluoric acid, so a weak acid, along with sodium fluoride, which we know is a group one ionic salt. So that will dissociate to give us sodium ions and fluoride ions. And so that's where that conjugate base is hiding. It's hiding and the fluoride within the sodium fluoride. I mean, wants us to calculate the pH of each of these two buffer systems. Now, as a reminder, if I'm trying to calculate the pH of a buffer system, then I can use the HH, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which says that pH equals pKa plus the log of base over acid. And so what I did here is for both of these buffer solutions, I just simply plugged in the numbers of my two molarities for each of the two situations. And if you notice, they both got a pH of 3.30. Now let's talk about why for a moment. Obviously, both of these had the same concentration of acid as they do the conjugate base. So here they were both 1.0. Here they were both 0.10, which means for both of these, I was actually at that ideal point of the middle of the buffer zone. I was at that half equivalence point of that particular buffer. And so therefore, when those concentrations are equal like that, the log of one is simply just a zero. And so that whole term disappears. So technically here, the pH on both of these was equal to the pKa. And again, the reason why they both had the same pH is because they both had the weak acid equaling the conjugate base. That means for this particular acid, the usable pH range, the range where I would still be able to add an acid or a base and see minimal pH changes, would be anywhere from 2.3 up to 4.3. Once my pH gets off of being in that range, then that means that as I add acid or base, I might start to see some more significant changes take place. However, let's look at the next question here. It says, after the same amount of hydrochloric acid was added to each buffer system, buffer A had a resulting pH of 3.2, while buffer B had a resulting pH of 3.0. So let's think about this for a second. Both of these solutions were starting at 3.3, so that midpoint of the buffer zone, okay? Both of these are going to have the same amount of hydrochloric acid, so we're adding an acid, so we would expect the pH to drop ever so slightly, not a lot, because we're just going to add a small amount. However, buffer A only changed down to 3.2, so it only dropped 0.1, whereas buffer B dropped 0.3. And so it wants to know which buffer had the better buffering capacity. And so, well, buffer A had less change in the pH, and so therefore it had the better buffering capacity. So now, let's think about why. What made buffer A different than buffer B? Well, if you look back here, buffer A had higher molarities than buffer B. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, that means there's more moles available here to cancel out with either maybe some base that's being added or some acid that's being added. There's more moles available to neutralize out than what we have over here on buffer B. So even though they are starting out at the same pH, even though they have the same pH range for their usable buffer zone, because this had more moles available, it's going to be able to take in more acid or base and still keep that pH about the same. So with that said, kind of some summarizing statements here. Buffer A had a greater buffer capacity than buffer B. 
because buffer A contains more moles of acetic acid and the acetate ion. It had a greater concentration of both. So therefore, it can neutralize more acid or base added to it. So again, the greater the magnitude of molarity of a buffer, the two pieces, both the weak acid and the conjugate base, or weak base and the conjugate acid, indicates more moles of the weak acid base and its conjugate partner, which leads to a greater buffer capacity of the solution. And so therefore, less changes in pH when an acid or base is added. So again, if I up the molarity of every piece within my buffer system, then I'm going to be having a greater buffer capacity. I can take in more acid or more base and still be within my buffer zone. I can still keep that pH relatively consistent. All right, I hope we're feeling good about buffer capacity. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.